Dr. Spiegel, I know this is a difficult question, it's, it's even for someone like you who's been in the field for so many years, but what is hypnosis? I mean, what is your theoretical framework when you approach that question? Well, the, you can't define hypnosis today unless you make one major disclaimer, what it is not. It is not sleep. Whatever sleep is, hypnosis is just the opposite. Hypnosis is an alerting operation, and today the best definition I can think of is that it is an attentive, an attentive, receptive state of concentration. It involves focal attention in a receptive uh, stance with uh, an ability to concentrate with a continuous ribbon of picking up cues uh, from the other person or from one's inner thoughts. So you're saying it's a state in which you are more awake? If anything, we are more alert and more awake in the trance state than we are in our ordinarily state of awareness. There is this balance between peripheral and focal attention. And the reason we got into this nonsense about it being sleep is that there is an illusory similarity in this sense. In both sleep and hypnosis, there is a contraction of peripheral awareness, but for different reasons. In sleep, there is a general withdrawal to enable also a diffusion of focal attention to go to sleep. But in hypnosis, in order to facilitate focal attention, we have to, at the same time, contract peripheral awareness. In other words, in order to see something, we have to forget things. In order to focus on this, we have to, by design, cut out peripheral awareness. That's what hypnosis is. Can we look at hypnosis as an altered state of consciousness? Or yes, in a sense, it's an altered state of consciousness because that's a general term that means so many things that it means almost nothing. Uh, it's like what, I'm talking, what I'm talking about is that another part of our consciousness that we have not tapped into, that we can tap into. It's an ability, a gift that we might yes, have. Yes, that's right. But see, our consciousness is like a kaleidoscopic. There's so many different facets to our levels of consciousness. And, but what we're doing is taking one segment of it and applying a puzzle form to that one right. segment and using the zoom lens in that area. And in that sense, we are, uh, uh, by definition, focusing on a particular area of this big confusion that we call the human mess, the human condition. Right. And so that's what hypnosis probably does, is that it allows, according to you, allows a person, if he has the ability, to use part of his consciousness that he may not be aware of that he has to solve different problems for yes, him. Yes, that's right. Well, then this brings up another important point about a misconception about the fact that is hypnosis projected onto the patient say if a doctor is going, is it projected onto the patient without the patient's yeah. wishes? See, that's... That uh, would be very important. Uh, that's right. You need to be voluntarily involved and that it can't be foisted or forced yeah. it on you yeah. or done to you from the outside without your knowledge. Well, the hypnosis itself is not projected. That's uh, 19th century hogwash. Uh, that was the mesmeric notion that there was some kind of a quality that was projected. It's not that about the only thing a hypnotist can project is bad breath. <laughs> but, but what he can How about do, sex <laughs> not that either, not that either, except if in his ordinary, in the ordinary um, interpersonal field, if the receiver perceives this person as charismatic or sexy or whatnot, okay, but the answer is in the receiver, not necessarily in the person that, that is being what he is. Hypnosis is not a projection, it's just simply a way of somebody identifying this capacity in the person who has this capacity, or as Dr. Wayne in Washington calls it, a gift. Mm -hmm. And to have this gift sometimes can be a real blessing, and it's also a tragedy if you have the gift and you don't know it and you allow it to be, become a mischievous experience. So that's a fascinating concept, the gift of being hypnotizable. That's right. Yes. That would make right. a nice title for one of your books. Well, that Dr. Harold Wayne down at Walter Reed uh, 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 coined that a concept, and I, it, it has intrigued me. I think it's a useful mm. way of keeping it in mind. Herb, in my early years in psychiatry, I was one of those amateur young psychiatric hypnotists. Mm. Uh, very rarely we used it with patients, sometimes at parties and so forth. And didn't realize it was a powerful tool, but also began to hear that if one symptom is removed through hypnosis, mm. the patient 
will, not may, but will only develop another. And for many yeah. years, hypnosis went into disrepute because of that concern. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could share. That's one of the fascinating bits of garbage that has crept into uh, psychiatric thinking. We have yet to find the first case, first case, documented, not just an anecdote, but documented data where you, uh, hypnosis itself was dangerous or that a symptom was removed in a non-coercive ma manner. I, I'm stressing non-coercion because if you coercively do something, you can create all sorts of things, but there, the, the pathology there is the coercion, the use of coercion by the therapist. But when a symptom is removed in a non-coercive manner where the patient is taught and allowed to develop his sense of mastery over it, I have yet to see the evidence of a danger, a dangerous new symptom coming about. What in, in fact, what does happen often is we get the ripple effect. The sense of mastery that comes over dealing with that symptom now often extends to solving other symptoms as well.